For my next trick, I'll make this 2011 MacBook stay connected to the projector for the entire presentation. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. The, the title of this discussion is log for shell exploitation and cloud range. Um, you've probably read the description, but we'll go over what this is going to be about. Um, I'm going to talk about what is log for J what was log for shell besides something that disrupted a lot of folks uh, holidays. Uh, I'm going to talk about who cares about it. We'll do some demonstrations with exploitation. Uh, and then I'll talk about how the range is built that helps demonstrate this exploitation. What I hope is that you'll take away an understanding of what the log for shell vulnerability is, why it exists, and that you'll understand this simple, quick, and cheap way to set up a, a test exploitation range in the cloud um, so that you might, you know, ne the next time a more relevant vulnerability comes out, be in a good spot to, to test out exploits against it, try out all the stuff you're seeing on InfoSec Twitter easily and quickly. But first, um, why, uh, why should you care about what I'm saying? Uh, hopefully you're interested in it, but if not, uh, <laughs> well, just leave. Um, <laughs> well, you're, y'all you stayed. I appreciate that. My name is uh, Carl Sikendick again, uh, call sign Rosie. I'm in the air force active duty. So we have weird things like call signs, just like in top gun, you know, there I was inverted. Uh, I'm stationed here in town. I've got a bachelor's in double E a master's in computer science, and I've got experience with cyber ranges. I've used that term a little bit range. What does that mean? It's maybe a little bit more common in, in the military, but it's also not totally uncommon. I was able to pull this, this dictionary definition up. It's a controlled, interactive technology environment where up and coming cybersecurity professionals can learn how to detect and mitigate cyber attacks using the same kind of equipment they will have on the job. So you can run a bunch of VMs in it. You can test it out. A lot of folks have known this as a home lab in the past. Typically that involves like buying a server off eBay, setting it up in your basement. My wife would kill me if the basement sounded like an aircraft every time she went down there. And it's San Antonio, so we don't have basements anyway. Um, so I've, I've been doing this kind of stuff on the cloud uh, and, and that terminology, you know, maybe you call this a cloud range or a home range in the cloud, uh, a home lab in the cloud. I, I'm just gonna call it a range. All right, so again, Here's, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, first of all, what is Log4Shell? Uh, in December, 2021, this came out, I think it was on a Friday. And so folks had just left the office and they were probably driving home. They, I'm sure that they stopped, they pulled over, they looked at their newsfeed because their phone was exploding and they saw that this brand new vulnerability came out. And some people probably just turned right around and went back into the office and other people probably turned off their phone and pretended like they were in Bermuda. Uh, but a little bit in more details, Log4Shell is a remote code execution vulnerability in, in, any, in any application logging using the right versions of uh, Log4J2 libraries. Specifically, it's got to be logging user inputs. So there's there are ways to use that log4j2 uh, library that don't log user inputs, and those would not have really been vulnerable to this. You got to take that user input, log it. Uh, log4j2 is a very popular logging framework within Java. It's in all kinds of different applications, as we'll see in a second. Uh, and and to drill down a little bit, if you're not familiar with what remote code execution means is just about the worst type of vulnerability you can get. It means that the attacker can execute any, any code that they want on your computer. So some, some common examples from today and yesterday are ransomware, key loggers where they wanna steal all your passwords, or maybe they just wanna generate a little bit of money on the side with a, a cryptocurrency miner, but it can be literally anything. And the examples that we're gonna do, we're just gonna get a shell running, a command line prompt running on the attacked computer. And we're gonna send that command line prompt back to us as the attacker so we could take more actions. But it can be literally anything you imagine. Uh, you just write a little Java code and you're, you're running. 
The root cause of this, again, is that uh, the programmers trusted user input. Um, this, this goes back to a feature. We'll talk about the feature in just a second. Uh, it's a feature in Log4j uh, that is able to be misused. Looking in the manual around the time that this vulnerability came out, there's even a little note when this feature was added to Log4j that you've got to, programmers have got to be careful when they use it to avoid logging uh, to, to avoid logging user input blindly. So that seems to have just been ignored in a lot of cases or, um, you know, programmers, they didn't read the manual. Surprise. So what, what is log4j? Let's step back and talk about what is this logging framework real quick. So here we've got an example where a laptop is browsing to a website on a Java uh, on a web server written in Java. So it's doing a GET request, and we've got the web server logging a little bit of information using this log4j library. Specifically here, the web server is logging the user agent string. If you don't know, a user agent string tells us what kind of browser the person's running. It can tell us if they're on a mobile device or on a desktop or laptop or something else. Um, it can even tell us what operating system they're running. So uh, it's very common to pull in and log those user agent strings. It tells you a lot about the people that are visiting your website. Um, in this case, nothing bad is happening. Log4j is just seeing that user agent, passing along to disk and, and writing it out like a happy boy. Uh, well, let's say you're the programmer of that web server and you want to get a little bit more complicated. You want to log, in addition to that user agent, the version of Java that your web server is running in. I don't know why you would want to do this, but it is a feature of log4j that you can. And so all you got to do is the web server is take that user agent string, append a little bit of text, dollar sign, open brace, Java, colon, version, close brace. And then when you pass that to log4j and you're using the most common method of logging, uh, it's going to replace that dollar sign, open brace, close brace bit with OpenJDK 11.0.13, or whatever version of Java the web server is running as. Maybe this is more useful in a non-web server example, but this was a feature that was added to OpenJDK on purpose, this text substitution feature. It gets a little bit more uh, powerful than just substituting in the version. Uh, when, you, when you get to log for shell, this is, a, this is a great way of demonstrating that power. Uh, Log4j, that, that text substitution feature can be used to run code. And if, if the user was not allowed to submit the code that's running, this might be a useful feature in some use case, but un unfortunately it's, it's very commonly misused and, and thus we get log for shell vulnerability. So in this case, Here's, here's a, a malicious user now on the laptop. You and me are sitting on this laptop and we're gonna give this web server a bad day. Uh, we've replaced the user agent string. We've replaced your typical user agent string with uh, dollar sign, open brace, JNDI colon LDAP colon slash slash attacker server, blah, blah, blah. Who, who can see that in the, in the back row? Can you guys see that? Awesome. Uh, in a little bit, uh, the reason I ask is in a little bit, we're going to do some demos on the keyboard. Um, that's kind of the more interesting piece. I think I made the text big enough that everyone can see, but if not, then please just scoot on forward. Uh, so, okay, so we've replaced your typical user agent string with this malicious one. Now the web server gets it. It, it tries to log that user agent still. And when log4j gets that malicious user agent string, the first thing it does is it says, oh, I need, to, uh, I need to go out to a JNDI server, speak in this, this little bit of LDAP JNDI protocol, and I need to ask it where to get some code from. So it makes a connection out to the attacker's server. It, it calls out to that JNDI LDAP server, and it asks, hey, where, where is this little bit of code named, in this case, log4j callback? You can call it whatever you want. Uh, and then the JNDI LDAP server responds, hey, here's a web server where you can go pick up this malicious code. So that's what attacker colon 8080 is. It's, it's that JNDI LDAP server, which is a specific weird language 
responding, hey, here's a web server where you can download the code. So then Log4j says, all right, now I got my web server. I'm going to go there. I'm going to download this malicious code. It doesn't know it's malicious. I'm going to download this code and I'm going to run it. So it calls out to attacker web server, which is attacker colon 8080 in this case. Attacker web server is going to oblige and, and give it back log4j callback dot class. And then log4j is, is going to run it and that's going to pop a, pop a shell and return it to the attacker in the example case. So multiple stages of this attack, none of them are very complicated and tooling is already built to allow all of these to happen really easy. So what is affected by this vulnerability? Uh, CISA put out a great GitHub site kind of the next day. So real, real quick, where they started taking user input on every server that companies and people reported was vulnerable to this. Minecraft, if you, if you watched YouTube, there were a lot of videos of people popping Minecraft servers because it included Log4j uh, logging and it was very vulnerable. Elasticsearch and Logstash, there, there are a lot of caveats to that one about its vulnerability, but uh, that was widely seen as, as directly vulnerable to this. And it's those two are embedded in a ton of other products. So then all of those other products that embed Elasticsearch and Logstash for whatever reason uh, were also seen as vulnerable. Uh, a number of other tools, Solar and Jetty are the ones that we're gonna be using in the demonstration. So Solar is, is not a product I've used before Log4Shell. It's an Apache search engine. Uh, looks like something that enterprises might use. And Jetty is a web server by JetBrains. Um, and it's there's a little a few uh, 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 caveats to its vulnerability as well, but it's it's just a neat web server. Hydra, the NSA's reverse engineering tool, was also vulnerable to this. A ton of VMware products. Uh, the Solar Winds folks had another bad Christmas, although certainly less bad than the year prior. And and just a ton of stuff is on that list. It used to be a really massive list, and now they've broken it out by A, B, by alphabet. So it's easier to browse. But you can go there and check out check out the full list, see if anything you've got on there is vulnerable. So really, is all this stuff really vulnerable? Well, if you're running a JDK version newer than October 2018, uh, there's an environment variable that that automatically makes this a lot more difficult to exploit. It seemed like that was the recommended fix at first, and then attackers played cat and mouse and they found some ways around that. Uh, so then they recommend, well, set, set, this, uh, set this setting in the log4j configuration. Log4j is extremely configurable. It's, it's really nice in that way. It seemed like that was a good fix for a little while, but of course, attackers seem to find ways around that as well. And then Elasticsearch, the major caveat to Elasticsearch is that for a few years now, they've been building Elasticsearch with a Java tool that um, it's, it's, it adds a lot of automatic security features. I'm not a Java programmer, I'm sorry, uh, but, but it's built in a way that disallows JNDI execution. And so I, I've had a couple people tell me that Elasticsearch is vulnerable. Certainly you can get those first stages of callbacks from it. I haven't seen anybody actually get remote code execution on Elasticsearch. So feel free to, if you've got a, a counter demo to that, then please let me know. I would love to see it. Uh, and and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on any of these as, as solid protections. Just, just update your stuff. Uh, the, the fixes are out now. Okay, so we've talked, to, we've talked about Log4j. We've talked about what Log4Shell is. We've talked about how it works, but there's nothing better than trying it out for ourselves. And so it, over the holidays, I had a little time off and I spent the, the evenings after my wife and daughter went to bed messing around with this. Uh, and so if, uh, you know, huge thanks to my wife for just ignoring all my BS around this. This is just a, a love, a love thing. Uh, in order to mess around with this vulnerability, I set up a range that looks just like this on AWS. So there's, there's three computers, three EC2 instances 
that I stood up on, on AWS. Kali Box is running Kali Linux. Solar is just running Debian. And then I've installed Solar and Jetty, and I can install any other Docker, uh, any other service that's got a Docker container associated with it on that Debian box, excuse me. And, and we could go further, we could install anything we want. Those are both connected. Uh, they're, they're on separate subnets but uh, they're connected in the same virtual private cloud on AWS so they can talk to each other easily through something similar to network routing. The only way that either of those can talk to the internet or that the internet can talk to them is through that jump host there. That's running Guacamole on it. That's an Apache product that gives you a, uh, a remote desktop interface to uh, VNC, remote desktop. So it, it's just a great front end uh, and in this demonstration, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to connect to that guacamole server running on jump host. Uh, and then we'll be able to demonstrate exploitation from the Kali box across to the solar host. So let's, let's do that. That's the fun part. Now, this is the part where I might screw up this connection, but I'm going to try really hard not to. So you can't see this, uh, but the, the code for all this was provided on a on a GitHub uh, on a GitHub repo. You can download it. There's instructions, so you can easily set this up and run it yourself. I wrote those instructions mostly as a reminder to me in a year when it's the holidays again, and of course, no, new vulnerabilities were at, will be out, and I'll want to play with them, uh, and I'll forget how to do all this. But it one of the things it requires is a domain name from FreeDNS afraid.org. Those guys are fantastic. And so this one is like log4jrange.lee.mx. And Guacamole just presents a login. Uh, and this gets set up automatically during provisioning and, and, and configuration. So I'll go ahead and log into this. I actually set this up last night uh, to hopefully appease the demo gods. We'll see how well that goes. It seemed to still be working a little while ago. After this part, we'll go through to redeployment so you can see that all work. But on here we've got we've got access to the solar box and we've got access to the Kali box. So again, this is just a, a regular Debian uh, Debian install with a couple containers running on it. Uh, if, when I ran sudo docker ps, uh, I apologize this text is a little small but but it's running essentially two docker containers a vulnerable Jetty server, which I had to create a custom container for to make it to make it vulnerable because the default install parameters of Jetty are not, it is not vulnerable. It's just some configuration options that make it vulnerable. And then install solar. This is the default solar uh, Docker container that you can you can grab from Docker Hub. Solar is listening on port 8983 and Jetty is listening on port 80 but we don't have to know that. We can switch over to our Kali box. Awesome. And uh, you know, if, if we were the attacker, all we might know is, oh, right there. All we might know is, uh, kind of the network layout of, of our target organization. And of, of course, we'd know our own IP address. But we see our target organization is uh, in the 10, 18, 66 range. So we can hop on over to our Kali box and we can do like an nmap n10, 18, star. And We'll just do a kind of a ping sweep of that whole little little bit of uh, of the network and see if there are any open boxes there, and then we can scan. There's only one only one box, so we should get that one back. And while we're doing that, let's look at what our IP address is: ten eighteen two twenty five. I'm gonna go ahead and open a new tab. Once we get that back, we're gonna to wanna to, um, port scan that box more clearly. I think it's 163. I'm cheating a little bit because uh, again, I tested this out last night to make sure it's good. So we should get 
in another minute or so, a little return here that says it's it's dot one six three that's vulnerable. But if we do a port scan against dot one sixty three just for time, we can see SSH, HTTP. That's going to be that Jetty web server, uh, and and some VNC and X eleven ports are open. If, if this was a real server, that uh, VNC might be much more restricted than it is. We might not be able to port scan it, and X11 would be would be off limits as well. So, so some changes you might want to make if you're looking for a little bit more realism. But here we're looking for a basic ability to demonstrate. Uh, sorry, we're looking for a basic ability to demonstrate this vulnerability. So if we just go to that, if we just go to that IP address directly, and we look at what's on port 80. We see it's the Jetty server. And if we go to that solar port 8983, we're gonna see it's solar, just as, as we would expect from this Kali box. So that solar port didn't show up in, in the Nmap scan. Anybody know why? Yep, it's not in the default range, exactly. 8983 is not one of the default ports Nmap is gonna scan. Um, if you were an attacker looking for specifically solar boxes, then of, of course it would be in your in your port scanning range. And if, and we're we own the server, so we've we've got an easier time. You can see here Nmap was able to find that one running box on the subnet. All right, so so we found our target now from the attacker station. Uh, now we need to set up those different servers that are going to that are going to uh, to get us to exploitation. And um, just because of Cheater, I've put a bunch of the commands and everything that you need to do this right into the GitHub repo. So we can just go there from the Kali box. Uh, it's got some information on deploying the range, setting it all up. It's got all this information here. Let's zoom in a little bit here. It's got the, the URLs on the solar server that are gonna get us execution. It's got the URL or uh, user agent string on the Jetty box that's gonna get us exploitation. And it's kind of got a step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to do this. So if you remember that first server that we need is that JNDI LDAP server. Well, as part of provisioning and configuring this range, I download some other dude's code to do this, this Marshall set guy. And, and I found out about this by Googling around and finding an awesome SANS tutorial on this. So thank you, SANS. Thanks. Thank you, Marshall set guy. That, that information is, is located at this. And they do a little bit more of a deep dive, especially the Marshall set guy does a good deep dive into what this protocol is and how it works. So just, just to demonstrate exploitation though, we need to CD into this Marshall sec directory. And then we need to run the Java server, the, the JNDI server that's gonna get us. Okay, so as part of this command, you can see it's just executing a jar, but we've got to replace this um, Kali box uh, IP address with what our IP address, oh, which is 225.8. I'm glad I checked. And I screwed that up, thank you. 10.18.225.8. So, what this is gonna do is start up this Marshall Sec server. It's gonna tell it anybody that's connecting, asking for that the address where it can download this malicious code, uh, give them 10.18.255.8 colon 8080 and tell them to download log4j callback. We can name it whatever we want, but that's the name we're using for this demonstration. Okay, so now it's listening on port 1389 on this Kali box. Now we've got to also stand up that web server so that we can serve our malicious code from, from that location. So I'm gonna do that over here. And just to demonstrate, this is, come on. What's going on? Oh, a little bad network latency. This, 
normally moves a little bit faster. So a little bad network latency. Okay, we're back to moving again. Okay, so uh, the, the command to start up the Python web server is right there. You can just copy and paste it. Kali's been updated a little bit since I wrote this. So now you got to say Python 3. This is, uh, if you're not familiar, basically the fastest way to start up a web server. Python 3 has a thing that serves files out of your current directory uh, just by doing this little command, HTTP.server as your module, port 8080. Okay, so now we've got a web server. Now we've got to write our malicious code. So I made this easy, just copy and paste this malicious code into a file. Even easier than that though, I've already, when you set this range up, the file is already present, log4j callback.java. And now normally you've got to come in here and replace this IP address with your current IP address. Since I tested this last night, it's already replaced, but um, it's a little hard to see there. So let me zoom in here. Let's talk about what this malicious code does real quick. This is gonna create a class, log4j callback, and it's, it's gotta be named the same thing as the file name because this is Java. Uh, but all that class does is, is run this little bit of code inside the static block when it gets started up. And what that does is uh, uses Java Lang runtime exec function to execute this command, netcat, is, is this NC, it's the Swiss Army knife for TCP. And it's gonna uh, create a TCP connection back to our Kali box on port 8081. And it's gonna execute bash, which is the command line on Linux and send any, anything it gets from the command line back over that connection and anything it receives, it's gonna put it right in the command prompt. So this is a very common way to shovel a shell back to yourself as the attacker. And that's exactly what we're using here, it's gonna work. So we've, we've got it all written in our file. We, we have to compile it. And that, that code that's in there can be anything you imagine that's, that's Java code. It can be directly your key logger if you figure out a way to do that. It can mine cryptocurrency, whatever you want. You can cram it in there, compile it and, and send it. All right, so now we've got our, our callback here, our uh, malicious code. The last server that we've got to run is the thing that receives that shell when it gets shoveled back to us. And so here's the little command that's gonna do that for us. Okay, so in this window, we've got our JNDI server. In this window, we've got our web server that's gonna send the malicious code in response to the JNDI server's redirect. And in this server, we're gonna receive our callback after our malicious code runs. So I'm gonna pop up one more tab. Unfortunately, the screen space won't let me show them all at the same time, or you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, in order to make the actual call now, we've gotta embed that JNDI LDAP string in there uh, into one of those malicious spots. And again, those were visible right up at the top. So let's, let's exploit this Jetty server first. So, oh, sorry. Just copy paste that URL in here. We've got to replace solar address with our solar box 1018 dot, what was it? 66 dot 163. Let me just verify that real quick. Ten eighteen sixty six one sixty three. Uh, the that uh, Jetty server is just at port eighty, so the default here is going to work. And now we got to cram in this JNDI LDAP colon slash slash our attacker box ten eighteen two two five dot eight, I think. And we've got to we've got to tell it which port to go to, and the port is visible over here thirteen eighty nine. colon 1389 slash, and then I think it's just pound sign log 4J callback. But uh, I'm pretty forgetful, so let me just verify. 
right here. No pound sign. Log 4J, call back. Excellent. So now if we use curl to browse to that website, this is, this is almost going to work. So we can see that curl returned the website, but we can see that we never got an initial call out to our JNDI LDAP server. And that's because uh, you also have to escape these braces because this is the Linux command line. So just put a, a backslash in front of your braces. It's just a, it's like a bashism. Let's try this again. So here, we, now we can see a ton of stuff was received by our JNDI LDAP server. Log4j tried to execute this a bunch of times. Um, we can see that our web server received the redirect request and it served up our class. And we can see that we got a connection to our reverse shell home. So let's look around. We can see this looks like something. Who am I? I'm a Jetty user. And so now you could do any kind of post exploitation activities you wanted to on this box. The sky's your limit. This is a Docker container. So a lot of the tools that you might expect to find on just like a regular Linux server are not gonna be present, but this is, this is an exploitation uh, test range. And so we don't really need to do the post exploitation now. You can use Metasploit to generate a Java meterpreter and that'll work great. Uh, as long as you kind of wrap it in a weird way, I think I have instructions on there. You can get a callback from meterpreter to to Metasploit, it's awesome. And then you got your whole post-exploitation toolkit. Everything that was that's part of Metasploit is, is available to you then. And of course, whatever else you wanna do, you can also do. Okay, so, so we, we had success on the Jetty box and let's try the Solar box real quick. Uh, the URL is almost the same. We gotta put in the Jetty port 8983. And we got to put in, I think it's solar slash cores slash is, is one of them. I found, oh, sorry. I found a few different spots on the default solar install um, that are vulnerable, 8983 solar admin cores, solar admin config, solar admin collections. So we'll do, I think I typed that wrong. Solar admin cores. Awesome. Okay, so we got we got something back. Let's see if we got our, oh, we didn't get a shell back. I must, oh, thank you. Ah, that looks much more like what I'm used to. Okay, so thank you. So the, the URL is correct on the GitHub site. I just typed it wrong. Live, no surprise. Let's see where we got our connection from. You can see this looks like a solar something. Who am I? Solar. So we're on that solar box now. It gave us a call back. Easy peasy. Um, all right. So we've seen exploitation. We've we've demonstrated this range. The next thing that you're you're probably interested in is how how did this get deployed? How can I run this? on my own at home using my own AWS account, or how can I set up something sim uh, similar for tomorrow's vulnerabilities? Um, there's three steps to the deployment. First of all, create some infrastructure within Amazon Web Services, and we're gonna use Terraform to do that. Configure that infrastructure, we're gonna use Ansible to do that, uh, and then start those vulnerable services so that you can go in there and exploit them, and that happens automatically as a result of Ansible. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate this. So I'm logged into my home server that I've used to deploy this. And we'll talk about the, the directory structure here in a minute, but this is the exact same thing you'll, you'll get from the, uh, the GitHub. Uh, there's a Terraform directory and an Ansible directory. Those are the most critical things. First, we've got to deploy the infrastructure. So we'll go into Terraform. Now it's already deployed. So let's destroy it. Terraform, destroy. I tried to type that wrong. So Terraform is going to do a little calculation. It's going to it's going to consider what's deployed currently to AWS and what actually needs to be deployed. 
And uh, since we said destroy, it's gonna, it's gonna destroy it all. Now this is gonna take a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll redeploy it again and we'll run Ansible. Um, but while we do that, let's go ahead and look at how this kind of works behind the scenes. So let's see if, well, I'm gonna do it over on the screen here, sorry. Oh. Awesome. So again, uh, the main directories in here are, are Ansible and Terraform. The README in the Terraform directory is gonna tell you exactly what you've gotta run. You've gotta create some SSH keys, just running these exact commands. You run Terraform in it and Terraform apply. And it's gonna use the, the .tf files in this directory to configure your, your range. Is anybody familiar with Terraform? Yeah, this could be like a whole, you know, a whole four hour, five day talk on how Terraform works. But it's basically gonna cram all these .tf files together and do the best job of figuring out what that says you want your AWS infrastructure to look like. It's gonna start with main.tf, uh, because that's where the base of my configuration is written. There's nothing special about main.tf. Uh, inside that, it's got some variables that describe, hey, we wanna do this on AWS. We wanna do it within US East 2. I wanna apply a tag to every resource that I set up. Uh, here are the Debian and Kali images, AMIs, that I want to install on, on some EC EC2 virtual machines. And here are the type of machine that I want to deploy, small, medium, and large, all set up in variables so we can refer to them later. It's also going to describe some basic subnetting that we can use in other files. Uh, the, the red box, the Kali box, the blue box, that solar box, and the administrator box, that jump host, are all described in separate .tf Terraform files. And as a result of this, we want to we want to easily pass this configuration over to um, Ansible. So this Ansible host TF file is automatically going to use a template to create an Ansible host file and to drop it in the right spot where Ansible needs it for configuration. And then there's a secrets.tf template. This is the other thing. If you want to deploy this yourself, you need to set up. It's going to ask for, hey, what do you want the passwords to be? You get to make them up. What's, what's your domain on afraid.org? And, and how do I update the IP address of that domain? Uh, that, that's the kind of stuff that you're going to have to put in your own secrets.tf. I wouldn't want to deploy that on GitHub. All right, let's see how this is going. So Terraform is successfully destroyed. So now let's try and Terraform apply. And right now, I've, I'm going to have basically none of this stuff on my AWS infrastructure and Terraform is gonna go ahead and set all of it up based on this configuration. It goes from me spending $0 to AWS to me spending about $3 a day. It's a pretty cheap range, fortunately. And it's gonna do that in just a couple of minutes here. So after we do that Terraform configuration, we're gonna to need to change over to the Ansible directory. And uh, if you're familiar with Ansible at all, we're just gonna run a playbook playbook.yaml. Hopefully I'll have time to demonstrate this real quick, but this has a configuration section for each of the different hosts, the jump host, the red host, and the blue host. And I can just tell it which roles I want each of those to inhabit. I want my jump host to be running guacamole. It needs Docker to do that. So I also want it to be a Docker server. I want my Kali box to have a desktop environment and to be running a VNC server and to automatically configure some of that JNDI stuff that we talked about, JNDI server right there. And I want my solar host to be running solar and Jetty. I also have the ability to set up an elastic search host, but I wasn't able to get execution there, so it's less interesting. Now, none of, none of that is magic either. All of those roles corresponds, correspond to a directory in the Ansible roles directory. And so this is the meat of the Ansible configuration. You can see there's, there's directories 
that tell Ansible how to set up each of those things, guacamole, solar, uh, JNDI, all that stuff. And we could dive in on, on how those work. Uh, if you're interested, it's all documented in code. It, it's all gonna work for you. Feel free to take a look. Let's see where uh, Terraform is. So, so Terraform has now deployed the infrastructure. You can see that the last thing it's doing is it's telling us the IP addresses in that environment. But we don't, we don't need to look at that uh, because we can just cd dot dot slash Ansible and we can run uh, playbook, Ansible playbook, playbook.yaml. Terraform has already created the host file for us. We're good to go. Now this is gonna take several minutes because installing a graphical user interface on Linux takes, takes a little while, but it's just gonna chug through. It's gonna deploy everything and, and it's worked three times in a row now. It'll, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have time to, to see it finish this time, but uh, it will. Okay, so we've, we've talked about how to deploy. We've demonstrated it a little bit. The overall cost of this is tiny. It's, de just, it's deploying exactly what it says here and the, the cost is less than $3 a day. You don't need to run it for a full day though. If you're gonna play with it for four hours, stand it up, play with it, and then Terraform destroy when you're done. Um, so the, the cost is really tiny. Um, this, this allows you to stand up hundreds of servers if you want and play with them for a little while for real cheap or just three. We've talked about how all those different components work. I've got a link to the code back at the beginning of the slide. Some of the remaining tools are, if this was a real range, we might wanna be able to observe those attacker actions in real time using Security Onion. And so it would be great to automatically deploy Security Onion into this VPC and monitor those attacker actions. Then you could get a feel from both the red and the blue side. That's not done in this yet, uh, maybe, maybe to come. It would be great to use actual Linux boxes or real routers deployed to AWS because right now the networking is just using AWS's uh, subnets and, and security groups. And those are kind of just a simulation of, of what we, we might want to simulate in the real world, what we might want to see in the real world. Um, and, and, and last up, I want to save some time for, for questions. So I just wanted to say thank you to all these groups. Afraid.org, an amazing DNS provider for free. So that made this really easy to demonstrate. Let's encrypt, obviously. Thanks, Sans, for letting me steal your stuff. Uh, Jonas Alfredson has got an awesome Nginx plus Let's Encrypt Docker container that's made my life a lot easier, including this project. Uh, and thanks, Apache Software Foundation. Not only did you make log4j, which gave me the impetus for this talk today, you also made guacamole, which let me let me experiment with it. And thanks again to my wife who lets me screw around with this stuff instead of sleeping. All right, uh, any any questions? There we go. We've got a few minutes for Q and A. If you have anything, just line up right here in the middle. I'll give you the mic for that. But thank you, Carl. So far, anybody got any questions? Okay, I think we're good there. All right, thanks. Thank you, everybody. It's just gonna.